So thank you very much for uh, inviting me and allowing me to speak. Um, I'm not an expert in care as a disclaimer. Uh, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. I do have an interest in pediatric spine. Uh, so I'll try to talk a little bit about laminoaxial instability, and especially in the context of the Chiari patients, uh, given this symposium. I have no disclosures. Uh, I'll skip over this. We obviously all know the normal anatomy, C1, C2, how they articulate, the ligamentous structures around it. And I'll talk a little bit more about the ligamentous laxity that we might encounter, especially in these hypermobility patients, uh, and what we might be able to extrapolate from some of the literature currently available. Uh, and so, again, we talked to ADI, we know about, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the PADI, the normal canal width, some people say, or the space available to the cord, basically the space behind, uh, in this case, behind the dens of C2 and the uh, posterior arch of C1. Uh, so before talking about pathologic entities, uh, it's good to know what normal range of motion is. And Dr. Peng, I think, uh, helped delineate, delineate this the best in children. Uh, I don't know how he got IRB approval, but he radiated children turning to hit the left to the right in a neutral position, studying lanoaxial rotary fixation. Uh, and in doing so, he helped delineate that, you know, basically C1, in this uh, chart here, uh, the vertical axis is the separation between C1 and C2, that angulation that's formed, and on the horizontal axis is basically the angulation from C1 and the neutral. So to the, uh, basically to the right here is in one direction, and this would be, the left would be the, the other direction. And so basically from zero to 23 degrees, you have a fairly straight line. So C1 moves independently of C2. So the same, basically whatever, each degree that C1 moves, the separation from C1 to C2 is the same, one degree. Beyond that, so 24 to 65 degrees, there's kind of a slight curve to it. So C1 moves a little faster than C2, but they move, both move in conjunction. And so depending on which direction you're looking, you get a slight curve to it. And then around 65 degrees, it kind of plateaus. C1 and C2 no longer really separate or move independent of each other, they move together. And so presumably, in patients with hypermobility, you'll have a different range. Uh, in his case, it was more than isolated rotor fixation, so we actually studied patients that had lack of movement, so they were kind of stuck together. And, but that's fairly uh, the range of normal that he described. And so we, as we've seen throughout the day, hypermobility is very prevalent with Chiari patients. Uh, Dr. Miller at the Chiari Institute and showed almost a 13% rate of rulus downlos associated with them with a high rate of failure and complications. Patients probably because of a, either misdiagnosis or a, you know, instability. We've seen a high rate of congenital osseous anomalies, plantar basia, retroflexion of the donatoid, osteodontoidium. All these things can certainly contribute to uh, why patients don't respond after decompression in some cases. Uh, but trying to find what might be acceptable as normal and not can be difficult. There's a very positive literature out there for hypermobility uh, in terms of addressing spine and normal parameters. There's a little bit more literature in down, although this is a separate pathology, obviously. But there's a high incidence of atlanoaxial instability with patients with Down syndrome. And the, Dr. Spitzer described this in 1961 early on. And in the literature, it goes anywhere from 10 to 30% of uh, adults and children that have some radiographic abnormality of another, increased ADI. Uh, the largest series that I'm aware of, Dr. Puchel, who had over 404 patients that followed prospectively several years. And about 15% of patients actually had an ADI greater than 4.5 millimeters. So it often we consider as uh, the upper limit of normal, usually five millimeters in children, and three in adults often. Uh, but they have found only 1.5% of those patients uh, actually had clinical <coughs> symptoms of myelopathy uh, or pain requiring a fusion. And so you could argue with what the indications for surgery were, uh, but their argument was that a smaller percentage actually needed intervention. And then actually noted that seven of them increased over time, the EDA actually got a little bit bigger, and 19 actually decreased over time, uh, which raises the question is, you know, could that be from people transitioning as pediatric patients, they get less laxity as they get older, um, will that decrease the ADI interval, and could you avoid surgery in some of these patients? Dr. Brockmeyer reviewed the literature and came out with an algorithm for down patients, sorry, for down patients, essentially looking at the ADI in the left, you know, basically he, this algorithm defined if it's greater than 4.5, and this posterior space for the cord was greater than 14, you really could just watch them or an eye on clinically without a need for imaging. Uh, with the presence of os you know he's uh, a big proponent that it's a sign of instability and you have to fuse these patients. In the middle, if that posterior column is less than 14 millimeters, he advocated an MRI. And it's probably an important, uh, 
bigger role for flexion extension MRIs in this population. But uh, in this case, it was just a standard MRI. There's obvious signs of cord compression, so edema, injury, and he recommended obviously fusion. Uh, but then the patients that didn't have a clear sign of compression it becomes kind of a gray category, as we discussed with the family, and it's not, there's no clear indication here, and there's a, really nothing in the literature to, to delineate what the cutoff or what the, inter, you know, the parameters should be to decide when to fuse a patient. There are several studies out there, and Dr. Pizzatillo actually some, uh, followed some patients with an ADI up to 10 millimeters that were asymptomatic on the clinical exam. Uh, so this raises, you know, it does confound the issue a little bit more in terms of what might be an acceptable upper limit of uh, matter dental or uh, instant interval. Uh, and just specifically talking about Chiari and minor axle instability, uh, some of the early studies, uh, Dr. DeBaris wrote a paper of five patients. This was the 1960s and 70s, so it was very early on. Uh, and they basically, in a series of 68 patients, they identified five patients with basal invagination and in lateral axial instability. Not all of them were clearly Chiari 1 patients, but after they treated them posteriorly with the decompression, five of them actually deceased and died. One of the five did not improve, and only one had some improvement. Uh, you have to keep in mind the mortality rate in their series was over 20%, which they reported as. Uh, normal for that era, comparable to other published data, which certainly nowadays is much higher than we accepted. And Dr. Goel et al. published a series also in about five patients with a KR1 malformation and glenoid axle instability, uh, presumed by the EDI. They all had osseous abnormalities, many of them with C2 congenital fusion to C3. Uh, two of them had basal invagination, so they actually treated those patients with attraction of C fusion. And the other three, they also treated traction, but just at a C12 fusion. And they noted basically that all patients improved. There were no specific description of what parameters, but clinically all these patients had a success. Uh, Dr. Menezes, Menezes uh, has a huge series, obviously, of 2,000 patients in the 90s. And of those 2,000 patients, he wrote a series of 100 patients that had an ECR malformation. Um, 66 had irreducible bas degree of basal invagination, and 34 had a reducible component. And they actually noted that and they, as they broke up the children in different age groups uh, into the adulthood, they noticed an increasing rate of irreducibility and basal invagination. And so 16 of the 20 children, they felt irreducible and didn't have basal invagination, whereas six of 16 patients in the 40 to 60 age group uh, basically had only partial irreducible uh, to be basal invagination. And they actually hypothesized that maybe this is a progressive pathology, so it might start as uh, some amount of axial instability, progressing to basal invagination, and then if the particular changes, it becomes more reducible over time. Uh, and then just to step on, uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, basal invagination, Dr. Coel broke down and tried to describe two different types and to redefine a uh, classification system, basically type one and type two, where type one was through dense herniation. So the odontoid tip going into the posterior fossa, as you see on the diagram here, above Wackenheim's line, Whereas on the right, he described his type two, which all patients had a Chiari one malformation along with this, uh, and the dens actually did not extend above you know, Reckonheim's line. Uh, and he actually discussed the possibility of just doing a posterior decompression in these patients and having a successful outcome. Uh, we, we could discuss. They certainly had a very acute CXA uh, ambulation. And then, more importantly, I think it's important to notice whether they're reduce, reducible or not uh, in determining how you're going to treat these. And Dr. Barari probably has the largest series published uh, looking at axial stability in the context of PR1 patients. And they advocated uh, that often anterior decompression was required in these patients. They had 11 patients that had a reducible uh, axial stability. Uh, most of them did well except for one patient uh, that required a reoperation for persistent post persistent posterior compression. And 28 patients that had an irreducible deficit, most of these had a transoral autoidectomy. Uh, one actually unfortunately died from meningitis, and this is just a breakdown on the right of how the patients did. Uh, and then 10 patients had a posterior only approach, seven of which them had fusions, and seven patients actually worsened post op, uh, even if the small group had a fusion. And so they advocated that, or they argued that the anterior compression, even in small group patients, had a fusion was causing symptomatic uh, compression in that after they did a transoral in those patients, they had improvement. Uh, and certainly, you know, there are different techniques to the diffusion C12. Many of us in here are familiar with them from books and daily fusions. That's a 
uh, variations of the song tag and wiring techniques to transarticular screws, uh, C1, C2, either go all the harmless fusions, depending on which one I've termed them, as well as translaminar screws in children that can have more difficulty in getting fixation in some cases. Uh, Dr. Gould did describe an interesting technique I think we heard about earlier today already with uh, basically distraction of the joint in a three to four millimeter space or placed into there along with C1-2 fusion uh, to treat this. And eight out of, uh, there were eight out of 12 patients that did this and had a malformation, vaseline vagination. And again, they were uh, good results and good outcomes in that clinical series of patients. Uh, I think the, you know, the, the things that persist are how do we find pediatric ligament, ligament elasticity and how do we combine it with our diagnosis? And furthermore, with patients that have EDS and sour malformations, what might be an acceptable range of normal uh, for them that doesn't require treatment? Thank you very much for attention. Any questions? Uh, well, first, uh, these are data from children, yeah. but in yeah. adults, uh, the C12 rotation is significantly less generally. And uh, Dr. Benzel published a paper where I think he showed the average range of motion between C1 and C2 was about 25 degrees with a maximum about 35. So uh, do you think we should be clearly differentiating between metrics in children and those in adults? Yes, yeah, so the majority of this was from pediatric populations. So certainly there's more ligament laxity. I think that's well established, both with the ADI uh, and also the rotation. So I think there are different uh, numbers that have to be considered um, determining cutoffs or potentially some patients. Thank you.